Alert, it is six o'clock. Welcome to Global Math Department. If you've not been here before, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how this webinar works. This evening, we'll actually be hearing from Peter Lilydahl, and he's gonna to talk to us about building thinking in classrooms. If you have not already done so, would you please introduce yourselves in the chat window telling us what you teach and where, and what your Twitter handle is if you have one. While you are doing that, I do want you to know that I am recording this presentation. So after this evening, it'll probably be a couple of hours before the uh, recording is ready, but it will be accessible through the same link that you used to get to it now. So if you would like to watch it again or encourage one of your colleagues to watch it because they missed it, that is how you will access it. I do wanna let you know that the global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. So the chat room is always available for you to talk throughout the meeting. If you have questions, I would actually encourage you, if you notice above the chat window, you will see some tabs that say chat, people, poll, questions, and Q&A and handouts. So I would encourage you to actually put your questions in the Q&A. It makes it easier for the presenter and myself to find those later. Um, and Peter has stated that sometimes some of his questions will actually be answered during his presentation, but it will be easier for him to access those later on in the presentation. So if you notice again, those tabs at the top of the chat window, there is a Q&A. If you click on the Q&A, you can go post your questions there. Um, I, my name is Paula Torres, by the way. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that at the beginning. Uh, I am your host. And I would like to do, tell you a little bit about Peter before he gets started. Peter is an associate professor of mathematics education at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He is a former vice president of Canadian Mathematics Education Study Group and the current president of the International Group for the Psychology of Mathematics Education. Peter is a former high school math teacher who has kept his research interests and activities close to the classroom. His research interests are creativity, insight, and discovery in mathematics teaching and learning, the role of the effective domain on the teaching and learning of mathematics, the professional growth of mathematics teachers, pro mathematical problem solving, numeracy, and building thinking classrooms. He consults regu regularly with schools, school districts, and Ministry of Education on issues of teaching and learning, assessment, and numeracy. You can find Peter on Twitter, I'm gonna post his Twitter handle in the chat window here in a second. And also he has a website, peterlilydahl.com. I will post that as well. Again, tonight, Peter will be talking about building thinking classrooms and how we can build an environment conducive to problem-based learning in our classrooms. So without further ado, Peter, take it away. Thank you, Paula. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you to the Global Math Department for inviting me. And thank you for all of you, especially those on the East Coast who are staying up extra late to, uh, to participate in this. Um, <clears throat> let me begin by giving you a, well, let me start by saying welcome to anybody who's on the back channel, which is, I suspect, I actually think of Global Math Department as a black back channel. So if you are on the back channel of the back channel, then well done. Um, I also want to start by saying that most of what I'm going to talk about exists in literature. Uh, anything that's been published, um, that or that's been written by me and that's been published, you can find on my website. The things that are in press or under review, I haven't posted there yet. But if you really, really want to get your teeth into these, you can email me and I will send you a copy of it. Okay, so um, let me begin with a story that starts about 13 years ago. I was, at the time, I was um, on ed leave from my teaching position. I was studying to, I was working on my PhD. And uh, a teacher in the district in which my children attend reached out to me and asked me if I could help her with problem solving. This was a grade seven, eight teacher. And I guess she knew enough about me to know that I was interested in problem solving at the time. And at, at, at that time, problem solving was becoming relatively big in the curriculum here in British Columbia. 
So um, we arranged a meeting and I came in the next day and I was, I was actually quite excited about the opportunity to get back into a classroom and do some problem solving with kids. And immediately upon seeing me, she, she sort of deflated my, my enthusiasm by stating that she had really no interest in co-teaching with me and even less interest in co-planning with me. What she really, really wanted was just for me to give her some problems. And uh, she actually didn't see a need for a meeting. She just, that was, that was my initiation. Um, but so never, nevertheless, I was quite, I wasn't happy about this, but I said, okay, here's the deal. I will give you a problem to use in your classroom, but I get to watch you deliver it. So we struck up this sort of tense compromise and I would be in her classroom when she delivered these problems and I would not participate in any way, shape or form while she used these problems in her classroom. So the first problem I gave her was this one. It comes from Lewis Carroll. If six cats can kill six rats in six minutes, how many cats are required to kill a hundred rats in 50 minutes? This is a problem I'd used many, many times in classrooms with students all the way from down by grade six, all the way up. And it's, it's actually a very good problem to get students to think. Now, this teacher, Jane, who had invited me in, had never ever done problem solving with her students. This was late in the school year. She had never done any problem solving. So I think we can all imagine what would have happened if she dropped this problem on her students. And to no surprise, it was a, it was a disaster. A forest of arms went up. Uh, students were asking questions left, right, and center. Jane was running from student to student to student answering questions. And this went on for about 30 minutes. It was, it was painful to watch, to see her running from student to student and, and literally just pushing them through the problem. And as long as she was there pushing, they were, they were moving. As soon as she backed off, there was, there was really not a lot of activity. So this went on for like 40 minutes or so. At the end of the 40 minutes, uh, the class was over, the bell rang, the kids left, she walked over to me in the back of the room and I thought, okay, this is it, one and done, I'm out of here. But Jane showed to have, proved to have a lot of fortitude and she said, okay, give me another problem. So I gave her another one. The next day I was back in her classroom, same disaster. So she asked me for another one, third day, forest of arms went up, she's running around for 40 minutes. At the end of that episode, she came to me and said, okay, that's it. I can't, I can't keep doing this. This is painful for everybody in the room. And I agreed, it was painful for everybody. Jane was exhausted and frustrated. The students were, were suffering through having to try to do this. I was bleeding inside watching how badly this was going. But I asked her, I said, is it okay if I just stay for the end, rest of the day and just watch you do your regular thing? So I did, I stayed in the back corner. I watched her go through two or three more classes of her regular teaching. And then I asked if I could come back the next day and I was back the next day and I was back a third day. And sometime around the end of the third day, I was struck by this realization that at no point in the previous three days of watching Jane teach, had the students been expected to think. There'd been a lot of activity, a lot of what I've since come to call mimicking, but this, this sort of activity where Jane had sucked all the thinking out of it before giving the students anything to do. Now, this is not a slight on Jane. Jane was incredibly passionate about teaching. She cared deeply about her kids. She cared about their ability to get through the content and she cared about their affect, how they felt about this. And her way of coping with all of these tensions was that she, she, she reduced complexity within her teaching. So nonetheless, um, I realized that the students hadn't been expected to do any thinking. More problematically, or more problematic I should say, was that I also realized that Jane was planning her teaching on the assumption that students either couldn't or wouldn't think. So this was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I left her room at the end of that third day and I went into another class the next day and I spent the day in, in two different classrooms in the same school and then in another class and another class and I went to a science class. I left the school, I went to a different school and I went to a different class and after 
touring around to a whole bunch of different schools in different districts, in different social economic settings, I realized that this, this lack of thinking was pervasive. But one of the things that I realized in touring around to all these schools, and that, keep in mind, this was over 10 years ago, but in those three weeks that I spent touring around schools, and in the 10 years since then, I've realized that it doesn't really matter whether I'm in a high school or an elementary school or a middle school, whether I'm in a school in the US or Canada or Finland or Sweden or Taiwan or Singapore. It doesn't matter if I'm in a high social economic setting or a low social economic setting. Classrooms look more alike than they look different. And for the most part, the classrooms I go into, I see a lot of non-thinking. Students passively walking or being led through the lesson. And, and I realized that it doesn't really matter how much we worry about curriculum or how much we worry about technology or how much we worry about the textbooks until we can sort out this notion of students not thinking there really isn't any point to much of anything else that we do in the math classroom. So I started looking very, very carefully at these classrooms. And I realized that over the last hundred years, there's actually been very little change in the way a classroom looks. Yes, the chairs are no longer attached to the desk and and our, and our boards have gotten smarter. They've moved from blackboards to whiteboards to smart boards. But fundamentally, the same thing is, is present in every classroom. Students are seated behind either a desk or a table. And a table might be round or rectangular or square. It could be trapezoidal. It could be lots of different shapes. But students are sitting behind desks. Teachers are standing at the front of the class, usually writing on some sort of a board for the students to copy down. Now, of course, there are variances, but for the most part, I realized that classrooms look more alike than they look different. And I realized that perhaps the answer to getting students thinking is to start playing with these non-negotiable elements of classrooms, the things that are the same between all classrooms and the things that haven't fundamentally changed in the last 100 years. So I recruited over the 10 year period, over 400 teachers. Now this was not all 400 teachers at the same time. This was just finding teachers who were, who had similar agendas, teachers who were trying to find ways to innovate within their practice. And we, what we did was we started playing with classrooms, not in, not in small ways, but in drastic ways. We started looking and experimenting with those things that are non-negotiable, the things that have not changed. And sometimes it worked really well and sometimes it didn't work very well, but it didn't really matter. We were just experimenting. We were trying to affect teaching and increase student thinking and student engagement through experimentation on things that typically aren't experimented on. So some of the things that we experimented with are, for example, the types of problems we use. Classically, the problems we use are either really interesting problem solving activities, puzzling activities, or they're typically textbook exercises or worksheets. Doesn't matter. Are, are there better problems for getting students to engage in mathematical thinking than other problems? So we played a lot with that. In fact, we spent probably a year and a half playing with that. And when I say we, I don't mean all 400 teachers. I mean a subset of teachers who were interested in that. We experimented with how we give the problem. Typically, problems are given to students either through the textbooks, they read, the, they, they extract problems from a textbook or from a worksheet or a workbook, or perhaps it's a problem that the teacher has written on the board or projected on a screen. But those are the typical way problems are given. Is one better than the other? Are there any alternatives to giving problems? How we answer questions. Teachers tend to answer questions. In fact, some of the research on this I've heard is it's astronomical the number of questions teachers answers within a day. And, and for the most part, we tend to answer questions 
uh, in sort of a, in a reactive way. And, and that's not to say that we, we always just give answers. Sometimes we answer questions with questions. Uh, is that better than just giving the answer? Is there other ways we can answer questions that are better than other ways? So we experimented with that. The way rooms are organized, typically rooms are what I call fronted. So students are sitting behind their desk or behind a table and they're oriented towards the front of the room. Is that the best orientation? Can we play with this some way? Can we organize rooms uh, differently? And we experiment with all sorts of different things. We experiment with having students in tables versus desks or in groups of desks versus individual desks. We experiment with having desks oriented towards the center in a circle or in a horseshoe shape. We experimented with having them set up in all sorts of different configurations. I even, one of my favorite was we, we tried the Ikea model, where you have to walk around the entire room just to get out the door. Um, we tried everything in playing with how a room was organized. We even tried teaching in rooms that had no furniture to see what that was like. Well, we got emails about that, but, but it was, we had some interesting results in doing that. We experiment with how groups are formed. Teachers typically group students according to a handful of heuristics. So they either just, high school teachers tend to either let students just work with who they want, that's not the battle I wanna fight, or they let students work, um, or they, they make students sit alphabetically so that they can learn their names, or they organize them strategically for performance. So they may try to group weaker students with stronger students, or maybe they group them um, homogeneously, so weaker students with weaker students and stronger students with stronger student, students. They might have social reasons for the way they group students. Um, we is one of those better than another? Are there any ways that we can group students to get more engagement that are more effective than other ways? We experiment with student workspace. Students typically work in notebooks. Is an iPad better than a notebook? Is a workbook better than an iPad? Is it better for students to work writing on large paper or small paper? Is it better to write on whiteboards versus uh, blackboards? We tried everything in experimenting with how, what kind of workspace students should work with and which ones seem to be more engaging. We experimented with autonomy. Students typically don't have a lot of autonomy in a math classroom. Would it be better if they had some autonomy? This really leads into notions from self-determination theory. Is and if we're going to give students autonomy, in which area should we give them autonomy? Are some areas better than others? How we give notes. Should we, should we just write on the board and have students copy everything down? Should we upload notes and have them download them? Should we use fill in the blank notes? Should we not do notes at all? Which of these things is better for engaging students? How we give hints and extensions. Is there is, is there a better way to give hints? Is there a better time to give hints? Likewise, is there a better time or better way to give extensions? How we level. Leveling is a term that Alan Schoenfeld coined. And leveling is what we tend to do after we've asked students to do an example. And leveling is this notion that we bring the class, we, we bring the class together after they've tried something and we share out the answer, either by having a student present or we present is there, a, is, is there a way to do this that's better? One of the things that my early research showed is that leveling is one of the primary demotivators for students. When they know that the teacher is just gonna show them how to do something in about four minutes and 36 seconds, there's not a lot of motivation for them to actually go through the exercises to try things on their own. Is there a better way to do that? And we experimented with assessment. I'm not gonna talk much about assessment tonight because I would need another three hours. So. Some of the things that we found through all of this exploration was startling. Now, now keep in mind, we were engaging with the non-negotiables. So our primary uh, pattern of operating was that the minute we found, the minute we decided to operate with something, usually we used a contrarian approach. We tried first the thing that was most opposite to the thing we were trying to play with. So if students are used to sitting down, we made them stand up. They're used to writing notes, we don't write notes. If they're used to having our, their questions answered, we don't answer questions. In some of these cases, that ended up being actually a very effective strategy. In other cases, we had to make modifications. But our initial move was almost always to give or to, to 
to move in a direction that was as much contra contrary to the initial way we were doing things. So here are some of the things we learned from this process. So it turns out that there are different types of problems and some problems are better than others. And we wanna actually begin our lessons with good problems. Now, what defines good problems, I will talk a little bit more about later, but it turns out that what defines a good problem for the first six lessons of a year is quite different from what the, defines a good problem once a culture has started to build. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> How we give problems. This one was actually quite striking. It turns out that the absolute best way we could give a problem is verbally. When we give problems orally, students are driven immediately to discussion, whereas when we give them in any form of written text, they spend most of their time decoding. It creates a very different type of behavior among students. Um, and part of the results of this when we were testing was that oral worked out to be much better than written. And of the written forms, textbook was at the absolute worst form of written text for students to extract problems from. Workbooks were a little bit better. Worksheets were in the mesh, math, in the mess there. What was written on boards or projected on projectors was a little bit better, but orally was by far better. Now, this doesn't always work because we can't say a quadratic. But one of the things that we learned was that we could write up a quadratic or we could write up an equation, but the actual instructions as to what to do with it was stated orally. When it came to word problems, they were all verbal. And this turned out to be much, much more effective. How we answer questions. Well, it turns out that students only ask three types of questions. In our efforts to try to understand how best to answer questions, we spent a lot of time looking at what types of questions students ask. And it turns out they only ask three types. The first type is something called a proximity question. Proximity questions are questions students ask just because you happen to be standing close to them. Um, they don't actually need you to answer this. They wouldn't put up their hand. They wouldn't walk over to ask this question, but it's a very student-y thing to do when you're close to the teacher. The most student-y thing a student can do is to ask a question. And the most teacherly thing a teacher can do is to answer that question. So that's the first type of question. The second type of question students ask is called a, uh, a stop thinking question. Stop thinking questions are usually of the form, is this right? Or is this going to be on the test? These are the questions students ask to allow them to drop into a lower energy level. The third type of questions students ask are called keep thinking questions. These are usually clarifying questions. They usually don't stick around for you to give the whole explanation. They really just want to get back to the work. And one of the things that the research showed was that we need to stop answering proximity questions and stop thinking questions. And in fact, those are probably some of the things that contribute the most to learned helplessness is our continual answering of, of proximity and stop thinking questions. The keep thinking questions, however, were the types of questions we wanted to answer. The thing we learned about room organization, and again, this was ironic, is the, the rooms that were the most engaging for students were the rooms that were the most chaotic. Now, I'm not talking about mess and paper and dirt everywhere. I'm talking about rooms that didn't have a perceivable front, rooms where students sat in every direction. And I can go into the research as to why that is, but the bottom line is that students behave differently when there isn't a discernible front. They're not trying to conform to order and they, they free themselves a little bit more. How, we, how groups are formed? It turns out that the best way to form groups is randomly. And that was by far the best way. It, it was better than any strategic efforts that teachers came up with. And I'm gonna talk more about that in detail in a minute. Student workspace, for those of you who have followed my work, are not surprised that the best student workspace is vertical non-permanent surfaces. But I wanna point out that this is just one of many results that came out of this research. And I am gonna talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Autonomy, 
we want to give students autonomy. And I'm not going to go too much into this right now, but it turns out that there's a huge difference between giving students autonomy to make decisions and actually pushing them into that autonomous space and forcing them to make decisions within that autonomous space. It turns out that just giving autonomy is like opening up a hole in the floor. The students will skirt around this hole and not actually step into it. Whereas, and what we really need is to get the students to seize on autonomy, to, to grapple with ambiguity, to make decisions for themselves. And I will talk a little bit more about what that looks like. How we give notes. The first thing we tried was not to do notes at all. And it actually worked incredibly well. The research I was doing showed that very, very few students are actually actively engaged while they're writing notes, about 50%. But we never found a single class where more than five students would use their notes after they had written them. Not one class had more than five students. Usually the number was three. So we stopped doing notes. And, and it actually worked really well, except for those three students who sort of panicked. Um, but of late, we've been playing a lot with this notion of mindful notes, and it ties very strongly into autonomy. What do the students see as important? What do they want to write down? And of course, younger kids need more scaffolding. Older kids need to have more autonomy. But the bottom line is they have to be mindful about what it is they write. And notes happen after activity. The activity is not notes. Hints and extensions. Uh, I've latched strongly onto Csikszentmihalyi's theory of flow, which comes from psychology. And this notion that the best way to keep students engaged is to keep them within a balance of challenge and ability. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that. There is a lot of literature I've written that's coming out on that soon, but it's, um, it's probably the most powerful and effective thing we learned from this research is how to build engagement through flow. But there's, there's a caveat that comes with that that I will talk about in a minute. Um, leveling to the bottom. We're used to leveling to the top students in the room and trying to lift the, the lower level students up to this level. And again, this is a very nuanced thing. The four purposes of assessment really emerge strongly from this research. And again, I don't have time to talk about everything. But aside from these results that emerged from these 11 variables, we started to play with which ones are the most powerful and which ones are the easiest for a teacher to implement. One of the goals of this research was not to develop, not only to develop effective practices, but practices that teachers could pick up easily. So there were other things that emerged around journaling, for example, that was almost impossible for teachers to pick up. One of the things we learned from this, however, was that not all of these tools were equally powerful. So for example, if you go into your classroom tomorrow and the only thing you do is don't answer questions, you're not going to have a good day. These tools organize themselves into clusters, into hierarchies of most effect and ease of implementation. And it looks like this. You start at the top. The top set of tools, beginning with good problems, using vertical non-permanent surfaces and form visibly random groups are the three easiest tools to implement. They're also the three most impactful tools. So, and I think many of you have discovered this who are trying to play with vertical surface, non-permanent surfaces or, per, or playing with visibly random groups. You're probably seeing a relatively large effect size. But these are not the only three tools. The next set of tools is the way we use oral instructions, defront the room, only answer keep thinking questions, and the way we build autonomy in our classroom. And in an ideal implementation where implementation is done thoroughly and with fidelity, that would come about three weeks after initial implementation. And the last set of tools is leveling to the bottom, using hints and extension to manage uh, flow, using mindful notes and the four purposes of assessment. The four purposes of assessment almost sit outside of this in their own sort of journey. But again, these come after development has happened. And this developmental model 
is not just for the teacher who's trying to get used to doing things differently. They're also for the students who are trying to learn or to resisting learning in some cases, what it means to be a thinking student in a thinking classroom. We can't pounce on these things right away. We need to build it in slower. When teachers become more experienced, they're able to do it more and more all at the same time. Now, <clears throat> Laura Wheeler has just finished a really wonderful sketch note that represents this entire model. And I got it just in time to include it in this PowerPoint, but it's a really nice visual summarization of what this journey is. And the articles exist that if you want the backstop on all of the nuances about this, and I have one that I've written recently that is especially for teachers, uh, minus some of the boring research, but it, it, and it articulates each of these a little bit more thoroughly. Now, I wanna talk a little bit just about this first toolkit, beginning with good problems, using vertical non-permanent surfaces and forming visibly random groups. And I am aware of time and I'm hoping to leave some time over for questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving at this pace. Good problems. Now, I said that good problems can be something that are different in the first six lessons and then the rest. So good problems, I've, I've created a link on my website called Good Problems, it's a page, where I'm trying to add problems that I think would be really, really good to start off on this journey with. Um, you can always go there and find it. I also have a link under, problem, under teacher resources that give you links to sites that have a lot of good problems on them. And my efforts around smudged math is in many ways an effort to try to come up with good problems that are good thinking problems that are linked to the curriculum in some way. And of course, we can also just go straight to our textbooks and pick problems right out of textbook pages because once the thinking culture is there, asking students to factor a quadratic or do a long division or multiply two three digit numbers or graph a trigonometric equation uh, are all actually thinking problems because once the culture is there, we stop sucking the thinking out of them. And we've, we've made magic with absolutely mundane problems once the culture is there. I just wanna emphasize that. With regards to the vertical non-permanent surfaces, um, I know that this is sort of an odd name and this is not where we started out calling it. We started calling them whiteboards or blackboards and we quickly learned that we can actually write on windows. So we started calling them windows. But um, early on, we started to get a sense that when students worked on these whiteboards or blackboards or windows, we were seeing a very high effect measure around engagement. So I did a controlled experiment. And what I did was I went into five different classrooms and five different schools and we let the, I let the teacher group the kids any way they wanted, but then I would randomly assign a group to a type of surface. Some groups got to work on vertical whiteboards. Some groups got to work on horizontal whiteboards. Some worked on vertical flip chart paper that was taped up on the wall. Some group worked on flip chart paper that was laying on their desk. And some groups just worked in their paper notebooks. And then we measured the engagement of this. And I should mention that in every class, there was a little bit of everything going on. So there were some groups on vertical whiteboards and some groups on horizontal whiteboards. And we did this in five different classrooms. And we measured the engagement using what I call proxies for engagement. So we started with time to task. How long did it take them to start on this task? Was it quick? Was it short? The time to first mathematical notation. So if they stood around and spent three minutes coming up with the, the, their group name was the mathinators and writing that at the top, that didn't count. But how long did it take them to make mathematical notations on whatever surface they were working on? Then we measured subjectively these other measures. How much discussion was there? How eager were they to start? How much participation? How persistent were they? And if there was a lot, they got a three. If there was very little, they got a zero. And if there was something in between, they got a one or a two. We also measured knowledge mobility, which is how much did knowledge move from one group to another and nonlinearity of work. And this one's an ironic one, but it turns out that when students are messy, they're more engaged. 
it's not an exact one-to-one -one correspondence, but for the most part, engaged work is nonlinear. And then all of these scores were averaged and organized according to the surface they worked on. And these are the results. Many of you have seen this table before. The first column is the average scores of the 10 groups who worked on vertical non-permanent surfaces. The second column is the average of the 10 groups who worked on horizontal non-permanent and so on. So I'll give you just a second to look at this table and see what you notice in it. Okay, <clears throat> so you should have noticed that non-permanent scores were better than permanent scores. And the question is, why is that? I think it's easy to imagine that when students have the ability to erase, they are more likely to risk something. So they are quicker to make notations, they are quicker to try they are more engaged in every single measure if it is non-permanent versus when it is permanent. This, this, this result has been recreated many, many times. Non-permanent is somehow more freeing for students. Um, there are some people who are doing research on why that is. Um, and I can only offer you the observations and some of the research I have done on that. But they risk more when it's not permanent. You might also have noticed that if they're standing, the scores are better than if they're sitting. And part of this has to do with, uh, there is some, some research on, on the physicality of standing and the way blood circulates and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, from a psychological perspective, students are more engaged because there's less ways for them to be disengaged. It turns out that sitting is an incredibly anonymous space. And when students are in anonymous spaces, they are more likely to disengage. And if the room is fronted and they are sitting, they are more likely to disengage and project the facade that they are engaged. So this, this notion that the data is telling us that non-permanent is better and vertical is better has led to the name of this of, of this tool being called vertical non-permanent surfaces. And about three years ago, a group of teachers or one teacher created a hashtag called VNPS. And if you go back in time, you will see a lot of lot of posts on VNPS that, that predate by, some, by a great extent my entrance into Twitter. And again, Laura has done a beautiful sketch note summarizing all of this all of these results. And I want to thank Laura for that because she just makes my work look so much more beautiful than the, the text and the numbers that I have. Um, and this is what it looks like in these classrooms. And one of the things you will notice is that teachers who are using this have had to reorganize their classroom to some extent. We need to get students having access to the boards and we need more boards in the room. And sometimes it makes the room look somewhat stark but it's, but but these are the consequences of wanting to have the students standing up. The the importance of having them sit becomes less. We'll come back to some more pictures of what this looks like. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, visibly random groups, which is the the third tool within that first toolkit. Um, and what do I mean by this? So the research started to show very clearly that if we randomize the students, we see a greater effect size. They're more engaged. Now, not at first. At first, we get a lot of battles. And part of the reasons for that is because students are used to being grouped. Elementary students are used to being grouped once a month. Secondary students are more used to being grouped only for purposes of doing projects. And, and there's a lot of stakes in this. If you're gonna be with someone for a month or if you're gonna be doing a project, it, 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 these are high stakes situations. So we started to learn that random groups were, were, were working better. And in fact, 
if the randomization was done in such a way that the students could see that it was truly random, then it started having a bigger effect size. Students were always skeptical if they couldn't see the random element in this. And we also saw that the randomization had to be frequent. So for secondary teachers, every class, every time the students came into the room, they got a new group. And for elementary teachers, two or three times a day to start with, and then maybe you could go a whole day. But students were much more likely to buy into this if the, if the intervals were short. So again, we were starting to see a really positive effect size. So again, I decided to do a controlled experiment. And I went into a school that was racially bifurcated. I went into a high school where we had, we had two visible majorities. And what happens in these settings, at least in, in, in BC, we're not getting race wars or anything like this, but what you're getting is what's called what I call a social bifurcation. So that the groups are big enough that they stay within themselves. And it creates almost like a us and them situation or, or a two teams within your classroom. And within each of these teams, you have the normal social stratification that we see in high schools. For example, you have nerds and jocks and preps and gangbangers and fashionistas and whatever, whatever sorts of labels you have for students. And these social stratifications, these social groups or cliques are, we all know are very, very hard to break. So I wanted to test the, what would happen with visibly random groups in such a setting. So I went into one of these high schools that, that fit this bill and I did baseline studies where I sat there for three weeks and watched seeing this sort of class system exist within the classroom. And then the teacher started her implementation. And within three weeks, these were the results of it we had seen. So within three weeks after implementation, implementation, students became agreeable to work in any group they were placed in. At first, there was a lot of card swapping, a little bit of bullying, and just downright cheating to get into the group that they wanted to be. And the teacher caught some of that, but the teacher also didn't catch all of it. I saw much more than the teacher saw, but what was interesting was after three weeks, all of that disappeared. There was a complete elimination of social barriers within the classroom. At the three week point, I would go into the cafeteria prior to class and I would see students from the class sitting together working on mathematics. When they came, and these were groups that were coming from so, different social groups interacting. When they walked into the class, they sat amongst themselves waiting for the cards to be distributed. When I interviewed kids, I would ask them, so who did you work with today? Oh, I worked with Stephanie and Christopher. Can you tell me something about Stephanie? Oh, yeah, 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 Stephanie's in my French class. And last year, her brother was in my science class. So they went from not interacting at all to knowing each other's names, to knowing things about each other. And every single teacher has implemented this with fidelity, has come back after three weeks and said that they have a stronger community in their classroom than they ever had. The mobility of knowledge between students increased. Knowledge started moving between groups, within groups and between groups much more powerfully. And when that happened, the reliance on the teacher went down. <clears throat> and engagement in the class went up. Now, this was not something we were expecting and this was not something we were measuring. But one of the things that happened partway through was that there was a parent-teacher interview. And the teacher came back after that experience and said that she'd had about eight parents sit in front of her and say, I don't know what you're doing in mathematics, but my son loves coming to class now. So I checked attendance records and attendance was up and lates were down after about the three week point. These were very, very powerful results. Um, and we've recreated them many, many times. And any teacher who has implemented this with fidelity, I think can attest to some of the things we've I've seen here, I've talked about here. And again, thanks to Laura, we have this wonderful graphic about what all this means and how it all comes together. And what this looks like when we put it together, <clears throat> students working on tasks in random groups on vertical surfaces, is we see a huge engagement in students. Working hard at these things, working for extended periods of time, talking to each other and moving knowledge around the room. 
they're just amazing spaces to be in. And some of you who have maybe been in those types of spaces will attest to this. It is, it is just a place that you want to be. The thinking is just humming. So there it is. There's the first three tools. And if you implement these with fidelity, it takes about three weeks before you really get your feet on the ground and you start to recognize that this thing is starting to have an impact. And you start to feel a little bit more calm with all the chaos and the noise that's happening in the room. The students start to transform drastically in these settings. Thinking becomes the norm. Learning becomes the expectation. The goals change radically from being done and getting good marks to engaging in the experience, enjoying the experience, and, and thinking authentically with the goal of learning, taking on the responsibility of doing so. Then we can fine, -tool the, fine tune this. <clears throat> now that we got our feet, we got our feet under us and we're, we're starting to get comfortable with this, we can start to think about how am I gonna use oral instruction? How am I gonna defront the room? Where am I gonna put the file cabinet? Where does the desk go? How am I gonna organize these, these desks and these tables so that there's still enough air in the room that we can move around and yet the students aren't sitting in such a way that the room is fronted? Then we can start to also think about what types of questions students are asking us and we can practice not answering questions. And there's some strategies that are associated with that, but it takes a little bit of time. It's actually harder for the teachers to learn to decode the question and also to learn to not react to the questions all the time with an answer. And we can start to work on building autonomy. And we work on building autonomy by by moving knowledge around the room, by physically moving kids around the room, not answering questions that other groups can answer for them, um, helping them to get used to the idea that when they're done, to look around the room and see what other groups are doing to, to, to take the next task from them. Or if they're stuck, to start to interact with groups around them, both passively and actively, to look at what other groups are doing, and, and to talk to other groups and, and you facilitate this by taking groups by the hand and putting them together and asking them to debate or discuss or to help each other. And once we got through that, we can move to the next level and think about things like leveling to the bottom. What, it, what does it mean to have a class discussion after an activity in which every single student in the room can participate in that discussion? How do we use hints and extensions to manage engagement? How do we how do we build our lessons around this notion that we're actually going to walk students, not from, from direct instruction to practice, but from question to question to question to question and have them scaffolded through their engagement in these questions from one concept to another. And our big, our big reveal on that is that we've actually been able to get through entire units of curriculum in 40 minutes in an hour. And in one case, we managed to get through all of one step, two step, and three step algebraic equations at the grade eight level in one lesson, just by having the, the culture of the room be around thinking and how we use hints and extensions to move that engagement through content. And how do we, how do we then give students an opportunity to write things down that are meaningful for them? And of course, the assessment thing. So I really don't, you know, I can talk forever about those last two toolkits, but I think I'm going to stop now and see if there's any questions that I can answer. So thank you very much. Um, there's my email address if you ever want to reach out to me and, and engage in some conversation. Uh, I will put this presentation also on my website uh, and you will see other presentations there. And of course, there's my Twitter, my Twitter tag. So thank you. So, Peter, if you go over to the Q&A, there's several questions that are in that little hopper, if you'd like to look at them. Ah, okay. So, I'll, I'll go through these and I'll, I'll answer them rel relatively quickly. Uh, I know it's getting late, especially for the people on the East Coast. But, um, so, I think I answered this question about the first math. Uh, maybe I should go to scroll to the top and start from the beginning. Um, Ah, so any research into problems that come from the teacher versus problem generated by the students? Yes. So in math education, there's a culture called problem posing, which is getting students to ask problems. Uh, if you read Joe Bowler's work, um, 
experiencing school mathematics. The students in Phoenix Park were using problem posing. They were generating students out of situ uh, problems out of scenarios. We did experiment with that, and it it is incredibly rich. Uh, it is not a good starter. It was better to start students with engaging what we ended up calling unicorn problems. These are problems that just are so engaging every time. Uh, the gold link or a gold chain problem is an example of that. We just we get students working on them; they won't stop. Problem posing is a more sophisticated way for students to to interact with problems. Uh, it was also much harder to vector problem posing at curriculum, which was which was not so big a concern for me, but it was really, really important for teachers. Teachers wanted to see that what they were learning and what they, we were working on could actually move us through curriculum. Problem posing is a little bit more like the Wild West. You know, anything can happen. So how do we, so, so teachers weren't as interested in moving in that direction. So how do we, so, so the resultant was that we, we focused more on, on, on hints and extensions through a problem solving structure which we found to be more effective. Having said that, I'm a huge fan of problem posing and having students generate uh, their own questions. And in situations where you do questions orally, uh, about two weeks ago, I was in Alex Overwich's classroom in Ottawa. And one of the things he does when he gives problems verbally is he asks students, he, he tells them with constraints, things like write down two binomials, multiply them together write down two vectors, find the angle between them. So he's not prescriptive about exactly which of these problems. Now that works in some situations, but it doesn't work in other situations. You can't say write down a quadratic and factor it because the odds are whatever quadratic you write down, you're not going to be able to factor in the way that we're, we're, we're vectoring towards students doing. So it works in some scenarios and not others. Ah. Okay, how does the class go over the work that was done on VMPS? So this is part of the leveling to the bottom. And there's a number of different strategies that we've played with. Fundamentally they fall into the category that I call gallery walk. So what we do is we make use of the student work on the boards. And then I take the class on a tour of the various works work, weaving a narrative as we go, progressing from maybe the simplest solution or the, the simplest strategy all the way up to the most sophisticated, with the goal being that every student can participate in this journey and, and uh, maybe not the last step, because usually the last step is, is really an extension on where this problem can go, but this sort of form of gallery walk around. We're not visiting every group. I'm weaving the narrative. Sometimes we do this by actually walking around and asking the students to not erase something because I need it for the narrative. Uh, Mike Pruner, he takes pictures of the students while they're working, and then he creates a narrative digitally by taking, by projecting these images up on, uh, up on a screen to show the various progressions through the task. This also then makes great fodder for students to be able to write things down. Ah, routine. Okay, Robin, I'm assuming you mean routines as in we do the same thing every day. Uh, assuming that, um, I have to say we didn't pay very much attention to routines versus non-routines, but we did start to see patterns emerging, things that were effective. Teachers started behaving in the same way day after day after day, and the new normal became thinking. So a very typical routine that we saw from the beginning was, okay, we're gonna come in, we're gonna go over the homework, then we're gonna do, do, then I'm gonna do the lesson, then I'm gonna give you some questions to try, then I will review those questions, then I'm gonna assign homework. That is a routine and students fall very passively into that routine. But all of a sudden the new routine is walk in, here's your random groups up on the boards, here's your first question. Now we're, we're extending, extending, extending until we get through a fair bit of content, then we do a gallery walk, then you sit down and write some notes for yourself. And finally, maybe here's a few practice questions for you. So the, routine, the routines exist, but, but the new routines are prompting 
uh, a different form of engagement. Having said that, we also like to throw a little bit of chaos into the routine by every once in a while doing some problem that is, um, that is very non-curricular and it really shakes things up a bit and reminds the students that, that things can be a little bit different. And the goal is thinking, not routinization. I'll, I'll mark that one as answered, even though I maybe didn't answer it. Um, so the issue with the notes, Norma, that we found was that almost every single teacher that was very thorough about creating notes for students was also very thorough about creating review packages for students. And the students were ditching their notes in exchange for review practice tests or review packages or the review tests that were in the textbook or in the workbook. So they were very, very quick to ditch their notes in favor for the things that were actually often created by the teacher or valued by the teacher as tools for preparing for tests. Um, it is really, really, really interesting, this notion about the notes and, and very counterintuitive about how students use notes. Um, curious about the first to mathematical notation. No, it wasn't any notation. It had to be specific to the task. So writing up notation that was, um, it, it, it could be the variables relevant to the problem. It could be information relevant to the problem. It could be a picture. It could be anything. Anything they did that was relevant to the problem and how quickly they got that out there. Um, and that was probably the most st striking results. When the surfaces were permanent, they were really hesitant to go there. But the minute it, and if it was, it was public and permanent, it took forever for them to start. If it was private and permanent, sort of like a notebook, it wasn't so bad, but we saw very low engagement scores everywhere else. So it's independent work and modality. So one of the things we've been playing with a lot lately is what to do, this notion of practice. So practice, why do we want students to do some, some individual work? Um, most math teachers will say, well, they need to practice. Well, it turns out that most students actually do individual work to get done or because they have to do it. So we've been playing very carefully about how to have students do independent work without compromising this this autonomy we've been building. So one of the things that's been working really well is to finish off after a debrief and maybe uh, some notes, thoughtful notes. Here's five questions you can try on your own, uh, or you can do them any way you want. And in those settings, about half the students will actually pair up and head for the boards and work collaboratively on the boards. Uh, half will stay in their desk. Half of the ones who stay in the desk will go, whew, finally I get to do something on my own. And the other half will sort of pair up and talk about what they did this weekend as they're working on them. But this, this notion of choice. And then in terms of homework, we've also been playing with giving questions there. But again, and this is tied strongly into the assessment piece, is are they just random questions or do students have choice? Maybe are they structured in such a way that students can to choose to practice the things that are they need practice on? These are still open questions. And it we have to be really careful here because these missteps around homework and practice are so, they're like stepping backwards and students are very quick to regress into this non-thinking behavior unless we're careful there. But I do value it. And when we have it working well, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, how does this research make its way into school design? Well, Joe, that's a good question. Um, I've worked with teachers where they go to their administrator and ask for another whiteboard and the, the administrator says, no, nope, you already have two whiteboards. Now, would you like an iPad or a Surface Pro 3 for your computer? And they're saying, I don't, I don't need another computer. What I need is another whiteboard. And they're going, nope, we're all out of that. So the classrooms we were working with, we have found multiple ways to turn almost any classroom into one of these spaces that can use, use be set up this way. And sometimes it's a lot of improvisation, but we have gotten pretty good at figuring out how to do these sorts of things. 
Um, administrators who participate in workshops with me are incredibly quick to, to remove barriers for teachers and, and facilitate the opportunities for teachers to be able to build these sorts of spaces. Ah, Kathy, this is a very good question. One of the starting, startling discoveries around this was if we give groups of students, if we give them 10 questions at a time or five questions at a time, almost immediately the focus in the group shifts from learning as they're going through the questions to getting done. And the speed merchants in the group will take over and race to the finish. Um, when we give them out one at a time, and in some cases, two at a time, the, sh the, the, sh the focus stays more on learning and understanding and engagement within the task. Now, one of the things from the autonomy piece is because teachers can't run that fast to constantly give the next problem, is getting the students used to the idea that when they are done, they are to look around at other groups and seeing what other groups are doing and stealing tasks from them for themselves to do. And when that happens, we start to see really, really great use of autonomy, the mobilization of knowledge, and, and the way students operate within these two spaces that have emerged out of the flow research for me, which I call perseverance and tolerance, and how they operate within those spaces to maintain a balance between complexity and challenge. It also frees a teacher up to move more slowly around the room and engage with the students, especially the ones who need a little bit of help. Ah, where can I read more about hints? Kim, if, if uh, I've written two, yeah, two articles about this recently, they're both under, re oh, one is finished. I can send that one to you. It's actually on my website, I think. The, the other one is under review. And if you email me, I can send it to you. Oh yeah, the low floor, high ceilings. So once we get through those first few two weeks of just using the, the non-curricular, really engaging problems. It's really easy to create good problems out of the curriculum or out of the textbook because they usually are already leveled for you. So we start with really simple problems. And yes, some groups are gonna shoot through that too quickly, but it's important to start at a low level and then build up slowly from there. And I wanna I want come back to this idea of this notion of, 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 of scaffolding them through a series of tasks. If I had to rename this framework, I would call it the flow framework for teaching. It is, it is the single most powerful tool that has emerged from this for actually getting through curriculum quickly and with engagement, with a focus on thinking. But all of the other tools need to be in place in order for this to work. The, the, that, that balance of giving hints and extension doesn't work unless I can see what the students are working on. And the autonomous management of, of their level by looking around at other groups to get either hints or to get extensions from other groups doesn't work if they can't see each other's work. Students don't work together unless they care about each other and they don't care about each other unless they know each other's names. The random groups are vital to this happening. All of the tools are necessary in order for this to work, but it is a complex toolkit that includes much, much more than vertical non-permanent surfaces and random groups. Okay, I think I've answered all the questions. Well done, Peter. Ooh. So if anyone, it is um, after seven, um, I'm about to stop the recording. And I'm pretty sure that Peter is willing to probably hang out and answer a few more questions. Um, if you have them, you can probably just put them into the chat window right now, since we can see them right there. Reminder that after a couple of hours, you will be able to come back and check the recording. And again, share this with your friends, because I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah.